Let's open our Bibles up to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, as we're cruising right along in the Gospel of John. We might get done before the Lord comes, but if not, it'll be okay. (laughs) John chapter 12. Let's read the first three verses together. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who, was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Let's pray. Father, what a blessed time it is to gather as the body of Christ to praise you, to worship you, Lord. And just as our hearts have cried out to you this morning, Lord, there is none like you. There is none worthy of our praises but you. And Lord, as we get into the text here, we pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to each one of our hearts, reminding us of your great grace and your great mercy and what you have done for us. Lord, remind us that we have been created in the image of God, and we have been created to worship you. Help us to grow in that, Lord, the the worship of you, to lift up the name of Jesus, to adore him. Father, speak to each one of our hearts, and we'll give you praise in advance for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the time here is right before the last week of Jesus and his public ministry. And we see that at this dinner is Martha, Lazarus, and Mary. And remember, it was Lazarus who Jesus resurrected from the dead. Martha, as we see here, she's no doubt serving as we've read about her, right? She's serving, keeping busy, and we see Mary, who took a pound of this very costly oil of spikenard, and she shows us what extravagant worship is. You know, it's interesting that when you, when you think about these three, this family in which Jesus truly dearly loved, I, I picture uh, Lazarus there just reclining, and as we read through the scriptures, he doesn't say anything. And I kind of like to put myself in the picture of being at that supper and would just love to ask Lazarus, how was it? To hear the name, his own name, Lazarus, come forth and then come. You know, I picture him. You know how sometimes you get a picture of the scriptures that might not actually line up with the scriptures? Well, this is kind of, you know, I used to think Paul wore glasses. They didn't have glasses back in the day, but his eyesight was bad. You know, it was just one of them weird things. But I picture Lazarus come flying out, flying out of the tomb. And then I ponder on that, and I'm thinking, you know what? That's exactly what Jesus did for us. <laughs> he resurrected us. And when you think about Mary uh, worshiping Jesus here with the oil and the smell of that oil, the fragrance going out in that room, I'm, I'm thinking this is exactly what God desires in the house, his house for worship when we meet. He desires from our heart the fragrance, the aroma of praise and worship going to him. What a wonderful thing that God's given us the abundant life, that we can worship him and to praise him. And just as we sang, there's, there's not to, nothing to fear in this life because we know this is not the end. Amen? So we see here Mary anointing the feet of Jesus. And it's interesting, spikenard, which was, um, you know, coming from plants uh, in the Himalayas, I guess, from China, India, Nepal, in the mountains there, and the stems being crushed and distilled into aromatic oil and put in perfumes and medicines. And so it's interesting to have a wonderful picture here of what true worship is. You know, it's not just something we come and do and check off the list. Would you agree? But when our hearts aren't reverent to the Lord, that's what it becomes. That's 
what our worship can become. But it's interesting. We're going to learn a few things about worship in the life of Mary. Uh, interesting in Mark chapter 14, verse 3, and being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. And we see in verse 5 here that the oil was very expensive, 300 denarii. One denarii was the wages for one day for the average worker. This means the value of the perfume was about a year's worth of wages. This is extravagant worship coming from Mary. And it's interesting that Mary, according to Jesus, she would become a living illustration of what true worship is. Check this out. Mark chapter 14, verse 9, from Jesus. As surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached to the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Isn't that interesting? Wouldn't that be awesome if your name was in the Bible like that? Essentially, you kind of are. But Mary, she would be memorial, and here we are. Uh, we read of her in the gospel and how uh, she anointed the feet of Jesus with this oil and with her hair. But this is significant for us. It's not just a historical lesson. We're being reminded by the Holy Spirit of what true worship is. Again, relevant for you and I. In John chapter 4, Jesus said that the Father is seeking worshipers and that we are to worship in spirit and in truth. I am so thankful that we belong in a church that we know who we're singing to. Amen? Because some of the contemporary music out there, you don't know who you're singing to. We know who is put in their proper place. It's Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. The whole important and substance of the Bible teaches us that the God who does not need anything nevertheless desires the adoration and worship of his created children. God desires or doesn't need anything from you and I, but he desires that adoration, the worship, our heart bowing down before him, acknowledging him that he is God. So we see here with Mary, we see a couple things in this passage. We see true worship is costly. The worship that involves giving to God and what is most precious. That's exactly what Mary's doing. Interesting, uh, they would use the oil or they would, you know, purchase the oil. They would put it in the alabaster flask and it would be reserved for a future investment. So in a sense with this, we see Mary as she breaks the, the alabaster flask and she puts this oil on Jesus and she's anointing him and her hair going on his feet and all. It's saying, you know, I am giving all of myself to you. All that means to me, I am giving to you. And when we come into this place to worship, may our hearts be as reverent. May we simply bow down before him and to be prepared to worship. Uh, you know, I had a friend years ago reminding me, it's always stuck with me, he wasn't speaking to me, but I took it as he was speaking to me. Church begins on Saturday night. Anybody ever hear that? Well, sure, you just heard it, so you can raise your hand. <laughs> really, we should have our hearts prepared to come in, in the meeting place, the assembly of believers, where we have the wonderful privilege to gather in a building, what we call the house of the Lord. But we can have church anywhere, right? It's not about the building. It's about the living spirit of God living inside of us. And in one accord, we get the wonderful privilege to come and to worship him. And our worship isn't just coming to the church house to praise him, to worship. Worship is a lifestyle. Everywhere we go, acknowledging that God is God. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And all that we do is considered worship, acknowledging God every moment of our life. 
Verse 4 says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why has this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. So we have a contrast here between the, the true worship of Jesus, the extravagant worship of Jesus, and then a contrasting with the heart of Judas, one who was filled with contempt, betrayal, and greed. And Mary was willing to give it all, and uh, Judas was essentially just wanting from Jesus. There's a big difference, isn't there, in our worship? Giving to God or wanting to receive from the Lord? True worship is poured out to the Lord, responding to him what he's already given us. Amen? Our salvation. But here we're also reminded true worship, whether in the house of God or perhaps that on the job site, your place of employment, maybe in family, worship, true worship, will be criticized. And it's interesting here, now when we think of the, the critical spirit of Judas criticizing Mary, you know, they should have took this oil, should have sold it for 300 denarii and fed the poor. That sounds like a good thing to do. It's interesting, in Mark's gospel, we're told they criticized her sharply, meaning it wasn't just Judas. It was others criticizing. That comes from the enemy. Some of you have probably experienced, even in the workplace or within your family, I call it the Eeyore spirit. You know, they don't understand why you take your faith so serious. Anybody ever hear that? Or why do you have to pray in, in that way? Why do you pray in Jesus' name? Why couldn't you just pray? That, that actually happened in my family once, you know, when I was radicalized, um, you know, by Jesus and my, uh, one of them first Christmas get-together and praying, and why does he have to pray like that? It's just they don't understand Anything that hinders the worship of God is a hindrance, and it can be critical. I call it, again, the Eeyore spirit. You know, you and I, we have been created to worship. We've been created in the image of God, created to, to worship him. So now we see in verse 7, it says, But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always but me you do not have always. Now, Jesus is not discounting the poor here. Obviously, feeding the poor and helping the poor is right in line with the heart of God. But here, Jesus is emphasizing the priority of worship. You know, soon he wasn't going to be with them. And that always reminds me that we only have one life to live for God. One life to live for Jesus here on earth. As you and I know, there's going to be a time that we don't have here on earth anymore. We get one chance to live for Jesus, to bless him with our lives. But here, as Jesus emphasized the priority of worship, it's, it's an exhortation for us that, you know, above anything we could ever do for the Lord, the most important is that we're worshiping him in our service to him. We can get so caught up in ministry and the ministries we might be involved in, the things that we, you know, do for the Lord and serving him, you know, but we got to have that upreach first. If we don't have that heart for God to worship him, we might not have the right motivation in doing what we're doing. At all, that priority of worshiping him, it must be there. Uh, for Lazarus, or excuse me, um, for Judas, that was an issue, right? His heart wasn't in it. He was a critical person of the worship, and we know that his heart wasn't for the Lord. Now, in verse 9, it says, now a great many of the Jews knew that he, he was there, referring to Jesus, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. 
but the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Bless you. Keep in mind, many of the chief priests were Sadducees. And remember, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. So Lazarus really caused a problem for them, a serious problem, an embarrassment to their theological system. You know, they should have been rejoicing that Lazarus was raised from the dead, but instead they wanted to kill him. And put yourself in Lazarus' shoes. Hey, how was it, Lazarus, that you flew out of that tomb? Well, let me tell you, Jim, they wanted to kill me after I came out. And you and I can identify with that as well. God raised him from the dead. Now they wanted to kill him. And what a witness he was. And again, you and I, part of the body of Christ, we, we relate to Lazarus in a spiritual sense. Just as he was a witness, you and I are a witness. We were once spiritually dead, but now we are made alive in Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 through 5. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and ready, or excuse me, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And we have such trust through Christ toward God not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. I love that scripture. Kind of reminds me that, you know, you might be the only thing referring to Jesus in somebody's life. You know, it's not very popular to say, hey, do you want to read the Bible to your neighbor that's not a believer, right? I mean, back in the day, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, that might have been a thing, going door to door and passing out Bibles. But now you might get in a fist fight, right? But it is interesting going out and sharing with people and asking them right on the, you know, right on, just like yesterday when we went out in the gauge team, you know, uh, how can I pray for you? It, it, it's such a huge thing to ask somebody, how can I pray for you? But to be on the other end, People are, you know, like, really, there's people that do this. You know, there was one gal, she was a believer, and she said, yes, you can pray, I have anxiety. And it's amazing how the Lord opens up a door when you just take your dog to the park. You know, dog's a thing. We did it yesterday, right, Sam? You take a dog to the park and it's going to stir up conversation, especially when it's a cute dog. <laughs> they can't help but to say your, your dog's cute. And then that just opens the door. But people out there are hurting. And when we do the simple things, and perhaps those non-believers, they might say, no, I'm good, right? Because we hear that. How can we pray for you? Uh, I'm good. Life's good. Well, do you know Jesus? No, but my life's good. And when asked, hey, can we present the gospel to you? And, and they say, no, your heart grieves. But you never know what God might do. You never know five years down the road or two months down the road when they might be going through something and just remind, being reminded by the Lord and then have an interest maybe in something that, hey, I got I to gotta find out something about God. I remember two years ago that person asked me to pray and I told him no. And who knows what the Lord might do? We are our living witnesses, living epistles to the lost. But we see here with these religious leaders, and isn't it horrible that they wanted to kill Lazarus? For what reason? Because they had a blind hatred, and eventually and ultimately this hatred was against Jesus. And again, you and I can relate to this today. The attempt to silence the work of God through Jesus Christ. It's called cancel culture. Has anybody been hearing anything about the cancel culture? Let's cancel the witness of Jesus Christ. Don't worry about it. It can never happen. No amount 
of what man will try to do, the testimony of Jesus Christ will never, ever be silenced. And isn't it amazing he entrusts you and I with that? To be faithful to him? To live for him? To show people that we've been transformed by the grace of God? Living our life different from when we came to know the Lord? That can never, ever be silenced. No matter how they turn it and spin it, there's been an attempt for, what, 6,000 plus years to cancel God. And they haven't done it yet. And for 2,000 years, they're trying to cancel out what Jesus Christ has done because of God's love for his creation. It will never be canceled. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So here we have Palm Sunday. It's the next day, it says here. The tenth day of Nisan, right? Reminds us of Passover, Exodus chapter 12. However, there's much significance to this day. Certainly with us, we celebrate Palm Sunday, the week before Jesus uh, you know, was resurrected. We recognize him coming into Jerusalem. But it's even more significant to God's people. Saved by the grace of God, somebody's listening to the Bible during the teaching of his word. Hey, we'll go with it. <laughs> it stumped the pastor day. It worked, so uh, where were we? Oh, yeah, Palm Sunday. Uh, this day was spoken of and waited upon the Jewish people. Uh, Psalm 118, verses 20 through 26. Let's read this. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made, so we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And again, this is significant because as Jesus, Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, that obviously, as we just read, a prophecy. And there's many, many, many prophecies pertaining to Jesus coming in to Jerusalem, revealing himself as the promised and long-awaited Messiah. I think of Daniel chapter 9, and I, I think a minute, so we, you know, when I get to Daniel chapter 9, you have verses 24, 25, and 26, but then there's that 27. How many, when we sang Hosanna this morning, you were like, save now, come Lord Jesus now for us? Anybody think that besides me? Okay, when we close today with Hosanna, save now, come for us, Lord. But can you imagine the anticipation for the Jews seeing this, because remember, they knew the word of God. And as we read here the next scripture, then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now this comes from Zechariah 9.9, which reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foil of a donkey. So they would recognize the Messiah coming into Jerusalem. But there was a problem, right? They didn't want a savior to save man from his sin. They wanted a political leader who would deliver him from the bondage of Rome. And that's nothing new Today, man does not think he needs a savior for his sin because he doesn't believe he has sinned. There's a 
not a belief that there is a need for God. And that is a perfect description of our world today. Man trying to live without God. It can't happen. We need God. We need a Savior who has delivered us from sin. And you and I, as we look on this side of the cross, we rejoice and we adore the Lord for what he has done for us. But the same problem then is the same problems we have today. Man not having a reverence toward God. So we see this. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If you turn with me then to John, or excuse me, Luke chapter 19, I want to look at the response of Jesus. Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 41. It says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this day, in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. What's Jesus referring to here? Jesus is understanding, as they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, they understand the prophecy but not understanding the Messiah. And he's understanding, and Jesus knew, because he knew all things, he understands in just a few short days, it will go from Hosanna, Hosanna, to crucify, crucify. And so he's weeping over his people. And he has the same heart today. He weeps not only for Israel and Jerusalem, but for all of his creation. And then it says, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you and one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. So Jesus, he weeps over the city. He sees that they are blinded. He's come to reveal himself as the Messiah, to offer salvation, to be the king of their hearts, to be the Passover lamb, to become that lamb dying sacrificially for the sins of the world. And the people were blinded. And Jesus shared what would happen in less than 40 years, what, 37 years from this point, where Rome would come under the direction of Titus and Hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed and the temple destroyed. They had rejected the Messiah and there were consequences for it. They wanted a king but not a savior. They wanted somebody to save them but not from their sin. And again, it's the same today. Man doesn't believe he needs a savior. So as we capture the response from Jesus, let's go back to John And we'll see how the disciples responded in verse 16 of John chapter 12. It says here, His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, and they remembered that these things were written about him, and that they had done these things to him. Now, when you just read through your devotions and you read that scripture, you're like, these disciples... But how could they understand everything? It's not until after Jesus was glorified. It kind of reminds me that we should praise the Lord for his Holy Spirit that gives us understanding to the scriptures. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals us things about God. In fact, the Bible says if one isn't born again, if one doesn't have the Spirit of God, he is ignorant to the things of the Spirit. I remember in boot camp, you know, they hand you a Bible to read, a boot camp. You know, the first time away from home, you know, some 18-year-old thinking he has their life all figured out, and then you find out very shortly you know nothing, and they hand you a Bible because back then that's just what they did. I don't think they do that today. I'm not sure. So I decide I'm going to start reading this Bible, and I didn't understand any of it. 
And perhaps you can relate too as when you started reading the Bible before you became born again. There's some good historical things there, some interesting things, but you can't understand the spiritual things of God without the help of His Spirit. So when I read this, I don't knock on the disciples anymore. I just praise God for His Holy Spirit. But then it says, Therefore the people who were with Him, when He had called Lazarus out of His tomb and raised Him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason the people also met Him, because they heard that He had done this sign. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after Him. Now, the people, when seeing Jesus, they, again, didn't see him as the Messiah properly. And it's interesting, the Pharisees here, they they exaggerate. They they say the whole world has gone, gone after him. That wasn't true, right? But the whole mindset here, even those who are bearing witness of Lazarus, it wasn't out to glorify Jesus. It was more like we read in John chapter 6 and when they wanted to make Jesus a king after he provided the bread and fish for them. They're wanting to get something from God instead of pointing out worship to the Lord. And as we will read on in coming weeks, it leads to crucify, crucify. You know, it's interesting. As I prepared for this, it's like a... uh, a double-edged sword. On one hand, we read of what God has done in the life of Jesus when he was here, riding into Jerusalem. But I can't help but to think of the times that we're living in now, understanding the times that we're living in. The day of our time. You see, just as the Jewish people were waiting on their Messiah, you and I are waiting on Jesus to come back. One, the rapture of Jesus Christ is taught in the word of God. Uh, The rapture of the church of Jesus Christ, I should say, when Jesus comes again. And God desires for us to have that understanding that this earth isn't all there is, is that there is eternity. But in his word, he tells us, how then shall we live? It's not to bunker down and just wait for him to come, right? Right? He has so much more for us than that. But if you would, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. So when we think in context of the Jews missing out on their Messiah, not having a proper understanding of the Messiah and what he was called to do, to go to that cross to die for our sin, we can miss out as the body of Christ on the coming of the Lord. And to not have the right motivation living in this life. It's not about getting, getting, getting. It's about giving, giving, giving back to the Lord and being an element for him to use. Look what Peter said here. And I'm fascinated by this. He said in verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, i got it on a line in my Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why? Because there's going to be a time when Jesus reveals himself again to his church, when he calls us, snatches us out of the air, or out of here, we're in the air, just like Lazarus came forth, that flying out of the tomb, You and I are going to be caught up in the twinkling of an eye. Amen? Okay. How then shall we live here? It's interesting, the progressives, the humanists, believe that man is always evolving. We're always progressing to something. And I'm still asking or trying to find out the answer. What's the end game? What are we progressing to? Well, the Bible tells us we are progressing in time, according to God's timeline. And folks, we are getting very, very close to Jesus coming back for his church. But he tells us in his word how we should live. Did you catch this? Gird up the loins of your mind. Understand. Roll your sleeves up. Understand what his word says and understand what he wants us to do. 
worship him in all that we say and do and resting fully on the hope of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 14, as obedient children. You know, there's no substitute for obedience to God. As people, we try to justify, right, when we sin. That's man's way. We want to justify every wrong that we could ever do. Praise God, we have the Holy Spirit, and he doesn't let us do that, right, as believers. But we can still try. Obedience, as obedient children, not conform yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Right there sums it all up, isn't it? When we live a life of holiness, God's going to be first. Our desire to live a holy life unto him stems from who he is, and what he's done for us. And that is the foundation of worship, is it not? Not based on what we could ever do for God, but based on what he has done from us. He has bought us with the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I pray that as we go on living in these days, you keep looking to him and ask him how he wants to use you. I love the fact that those teenagers over there now, they are being so encouraged this week. They might forget by tomorrow, but praise God, there's the Holy Spirit that's going to remind them. And I pray also the Holy Spirit for you to be in constant memory of what God has done for you and the blessed promises that we have in Him, knowing that this earth is not all there is. We have a God who's in control, and He's demonstrated His love for you and I. That is enough to live that holy life unto him. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. And I thank you for these precious people here this morning, Lord. And we pray for your spirit to continue to work in their hearts, to build them up in the faith, to encourage them to live life in a manner that is reverent towards you, God. For you are truly the only one worthy of our praise and our worship. I pray, Lord, for those that are struggling in any way, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would comfort them, strengthen them. Father, we love you. And we pray that as your Spirit moves in our hearts in these last days, God, that each and every day we will be looking for you and the glorious, blessed hope, the promise that we have that you're coming for your church, Lord, and that we would live in such a way that represents living out that, ex you know, being expected for you to come at any moment, Lord. Lord, we can't do that without your help. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.